tēnā no tātou katoa, nau mai haramai ki te whare kōrero o tū haurangi. The stories you're about to see and hear provide a glimpse into the history of our tribe, Tu Haurangi. And as with all stories, there are variations, all of which have their own validity. These are the stories that have been handed down to us, and it is our pleasure to share them with you. Nareira Tu Haurangi Pirinaki, kia pupu noa ke ai, e tiwi te nga tātou katoa. behind me is Otumuchu uh, at the north northern end of Tarawera. Past site of Ngāti Rangiti. And Ngāti Rangiti, we, in our way at Te Rāte Aohi, we sing uh, Tōku Hoa Moinga, that line. Literally, it means my bedfellow. And what it refers to is that Ngāti Rangitihi and Tuharangi jointly inhabited uh, Lake Tarawera. So from here around to the outlet at Te Tapahoro, uh, around to the base of the mountain, and also the peninsula of Moura was settled by Ngāti Rangiti. The bays Ohorongo and uh, Waitangi, Tokineho, uh, Tawaroa, right round to Te Ariki, and the true Haringi side of the lake. So the pa o Tumutu was once inhabited by Ngāti Rangiti. But eventually, both the pa and the land, as far as Maungarawhiri, came under the control of our hapu, Ngāti Uruhina. The main sub-tribe in the bays that we're looking at Ohorongo and Waitangi is a sub-tribe called Ngāti Uruhina. And uh, Uruhina herself, a female, one of the wives of Wahiao. And her descendants settled not only Tarawera, but Okareka as well, having a number of pa sites. Most of the descendants now come under Ngāti Wahiao, but they are a separate hapu, Ngāti Uruhina. The camp Today that the Tuarangi inhabits during the summer, everyone calls it the camp, is right on the site, the base of Ōrongo. The pa, ancient pa is up the back, you can see there on the hill. Uh, and each year, each summer, uh, Tuarangi come out, uh, 
create themselves a campsite in the bush with their slash hooks or they bring out uh, a marquee or caravan and they spend their time out here in the summer. They'll still be here, they commute back to work until their last days of summer and it's just a communal way of uh, I suppose reconnecting again with our lake, Tarawera. The uh, pa site, like a lot of pa sites, um, often they became abandoned when someone, a chief, died before they could take him out of his whare. And the whare became tapu. And then you find a lot of pa sites on hills have become cemeteries. And even today, um, trustees of the land say they find, they come across bones up there as a pa site becomes a cemetery. The talk of Ngāti Tāui is, the talk of, is really to talk about two haurangi and they, their movements and how they moved around the lakes. Two haurangi is a big tribe and it had several hapu. There were a long, later to the Ngāti Tāui here were other, all the other hapu of two haurangi and I'll say Ngāti Tū Ohonoa, Tū Tea, Uruhina. Hapu names that aren't so prominent now. Not far from here are the other areas where the two Haurangi Hapus live, their villages, their um, cultivation areas. Up above here was a ridge full of uh, defensive paths, which are all, all named. And if you're lucky to go and look, and if you are here for the right reason, you can find them. And uh, two Haurangi's lands, of course, as Rangitihi spoke of, not just confined to this lake. Oh, I'd say Rotomahana o Karaka, Tikitapu Roto Kakahi, and I'll include Rotorua and Rotoiti too. Those were the lakes that uh, two Haurangi affiliated to. So to speak of uh, two Haurangi being um, confined to just Tarawera now with some like to say it, it is uh, not quite correct. This was just one of their, say, seasonal places where they lived. And uh, Rotomahana was known for a place like that where you'd, where you'd come to eat seasonally. They used to cut channels with the ducks where they would collect ducks when they, and I don't mean spear them, they would just dig a channel and the ducks would swim up then they'd just pick them out by hand and um, take as many as they, they needed. But um, like all lakes they were teeming with, um, with native species of food and um, of koda and koaro. Inanga, tuna, and uh, lots of bird life that's around here. The trees were more Māori trees, they're, they're berry trees. And uh, at times they'd, uh, they'd take them and dry them on the, the cinder blocks. And even the the blocks where they used to dry food was that they all had names. So, um, these hills are all named and and a lot of them as you can see have are easy to defend and uh, that's why Tiariki was hard to penetrate. There's steep ravines here and, and they're still here today.
There was not far from here a, a hills where ancestors died near Riripakaiti. Of course, you might have heard of the Pukekaikahu where Rangikatukua died, Tionga died, I believe, there, and, and others. They were ambushed by uh, Tuhoi. And that was the last big battle between Te Arawa and Tuhoi. A few years beforehand, Tu Haurangi, under the leadership of our key ancestors, uh, Tionga, his cousin Te Rangi Katukua, uh, Te Waha Kaikapua, and Te Hurinui, fought a battle at, uh, over by Kawaro against Nasiawa. Different names for that particular battle, but one name is uh, the Battle of Te Tumu. And it was there that uh, Tionga slayed uh, Te Ramaapokura. Two years later, Tionga and Te Rangi Katukua attacked Tuatahuna, without any great casualty or success, and then returned. What then happened was uh, Tuhoi gathered en masse under the leadership of Te Pūrewa and came to Pukekaikahu here. So from Tuatahuna, over there, <laughs> way, uh, yeah, way over there, uh, Tuhoi uh, gathered their, uh, their people and trekked from Ruatahuna to Pukekaikahu. Not sure exactly about the, the numbers of Tuhoi that came, but it was a significant Opetaua war party. This was a long way for Tuhoi to come, and in terms of battles and victories, the ultimate victory was to defeat your opposition on their land. And so that's what Tuhoi came here to do. What then happened was that the main body of the war party of Te Opetaua stayed here and they sent a smaller group of around about 70 or 80 over and that smaller group attacked Te Ariki, which is just uh, at Tarawera, and then across the motor and then ran back to Pukekaika. Our ancestors then pursued them from Tarawera uh, back to here. And the main Opetaua of Tuhoi was waiting here for our ancestors who were pursuing them. And of course, by the time our ancestors got here, they were, well, not as uh, energetic. Um, and realised when they got here that, that, that we were in trouble. At the end of the day, Tuhoi uh, won, won the battle at Pukekaikahu and Ngāti Awa. Thinking back to Te Rama Apukura a few years earlier, so it was Tuhoi and Ngāti Awa. One of our tour Te Hurinui was slain here at Pukekaikahu and his widow, Hine Tūrama, composed a kaiora ora, or a derisive chant slash haka to commemorate the loss of that occurred. And Hine Ituroma was from uh, Ngāti Whakaua. A ope taua from Te Arawa again. And depending on whose numbers you accept, somewhere between four to 800 warriors from here went across to Tuhoi to a pa called Te Taumato Te Riu. And the chief of that particular pa was Te Aihurangi. The purpose of, of us travelling over to uh, Te Taumata o Te Riu was to secure the head of Te Hurinu. Uh, so our warriors were slaughtered here, decapitated, and, all of, and the heads were taken back uh, to Tuvo. So at Te Taumata o Te Riu, uh, four to eight hundred warriors performed that particular haka and uh, two hoi were amazed by the haka hence came the proverb Kotitirigiterangi Kotearawa Kitefino
what then happened was uh, Te Aihurangi returned the head to uh, Hine Turama and then a hākari or feast or celebration occurred for, for three days apparently and that is regarded as Te Tatau Paunamu or the sealing of the peace treaty uh, between Te Arawa and Tūhoi. Raha fiti fiti We, we used to think of uh, Rangitihi and uh, Tuhorangi as being the same same tribe. Their whakapapa dictates it, and uh, the, the chiefs they call Rangitihi, we all call Tuhorangi, and um, such as uh, Muko Nui Rangi, Te Rangi Katukua. And, um, but as tribes grow, hapu grow, they become their own iwi, and that has happened with our with our own iwi. When they had their differences with Ngāti Rangitihi, we'd like to think that they were into hapu uh, differences that uh, took place. That was um, because of um, the nature of the tourism becoming prominent in the area. The uh, Ngāti Rangitihi saw opportunities and thought that Tu Haurangi would allow them and of course, two Haurangi weren't happy with uh, Ngāti Rangitihi putting a house up, so it was a, a time that split the iwi. A battle was fought around about the 1830s for five years between two Haurangi and Ngāti Rangitihi, and they had agreed that whoever won would have the mana over this uh, lake, Rotomahana, because uh, the tourists were flocking uh, to the uh, pink and white terraces. Of course, before the Pākehā came here, there was no tourists. But of course, the, because of the beauty of the terraces, tourism soon became prominent. Famous artists came here and took paintings of the area, and, and they've been restored and kept by collectors. I believe Diefenbach came here, our famous explorer. Uh, George Gray was brought down here and 
other well-known members of the Christian faith, uh, Thomas Chapman, and they were allowed to do, in fact, even to shoot uh, birds out of season because um, of their status. Dignitaries would come here on their way to visit the terraces and they'd be brought before the chief, Rangi Hewe. His sons would uh, take them up to the, the terraces. Of course, the tourists were ferried from the back of Kaiweka to the back over beyond Te Tarata. The, the, the terraces were around the corner and on that side was the pink and, and just around here was the white. However, Tuhaurangi is the acknowledged kaitiaki of this lake, although Rangitihi like to say they have a, a connection with this lake. I stress, in their era, the chiefs Rangipuafe, Rangihewe had mana over the, this, this lake in, in their time. Not only the men fought, but the women used to fight in our war, so the women would uh, be as ready as the men to, to defend their tribe. And that, that happened here with many other women. And, um, and the battles that took place here over, they call them the Tiariki battles. They were uh, fought over a couple of years, over three or four three or four battles, but um, the, the, the end result was um, two Haurangi called a peace and um, dictated uh, what would happen. Me tehi maura, uh, i hākai pari. I tapa horo. E rā wahi katoa. Titi wai ko fiti fiti. Roto tomo po. Kanohona <laughs> Era era kau papa katua ngata ke iara ke hepaka ngai hiwa ngenu iara ta ke a ke nai e wehi a ke na paka ngai hiwa ngenu i atu a hura ngi me rangiti kare a rangiti hi pakutua karaka o ino karoha ke a ngati rangiti hi ke a ngati rangiti hi karoha ke atu a hura ngi ke atu a hura ngi i te kaha ai tua o nata mariki. Irotainapaka. Na, 
a kari roi muri mai ka hunuku a rangiti ka whai e rātau te awa te, te awa o Tarawera. A ka tai atu ki, ki te awa te atua, ki matata rātau noho ai. A, kei reira rātau e noho ana i tēnei ra. The tribes that fought here are well documented. There's been generations of fighting between our tribes and other tribes here. And, and as Rangitihi correctly pointed out, all the descendants of Rangitihi, the, our eponymous ancestor, who had um, Rakeao and Hapu Moana. Now, Hapu Manawa e Waru o Te Aroa. They've all lived here, and Ngati Pikeao has links here. And uh, we should acknowledge the other tribes that have links to this lake. But, um, it is called a Tuhorangi Lake and I suppose it's, we had the Ahika. But we should all, always acknowledge our, the history of other hapu that have lived here before us. The headland Tauroa was formerly Tuharangi's main pass site. In times of war, all the Tuharangi hapu were called here and we'd live upon this headland uh, for a number of years really. For example, in the 1830, period of 1830 to 1835, we went to war with Ngāti our neighbours, over Rotomahana and everyone came and lived in this part. Uh, again, in mid-1860s, when the New Zealand land wars occurred, we had tribes crisscrossing our tribal boundaries. So for safety, our Paramount Chief called everyone into this part here, Tawaro. However, it's uh, probably more well known today by the name of Kariri, or Galilee. And that name was um, placed upon it by Reverend Seymour Spencer. An American, he came to Tarawera and had a huge impact on Tuarangi. He was an Anglican minister and he set up the first mission here on Lake Tarawera, here at a place he wanted to call uh, Galilee, Kariri. Uh, Spencer and his family had their first church built out of Ropo. Uh, it unfortunately burnt down because one of the uh, Tuarangi uh, followers. Uh, was a pipe smoker and he put his pipe into the wall and it caught on fire and burnt down. So when he rebuilt his church out of timber, that was one of the rules they all held fast to, no uh, smokes or pipes in church. He stayed here for seven or eight years. Uh, he had a huge following right around the lake. And then he had a plan to move and start an agricultural settlement. And that settlement became known as Te Wairoa. Te Wairoa uh, was chosen because the valley it's in had far more flat land than was on any of the lake frontage at Tarawera. And he had actually planned out a church, a school up on the hill, and was very keen on teaching Tuarangi how to farm, become farmers as a way of living. We're here at the Wairoa Valley, the settlement that was actually decided upon by the Reverend Seymour Spencer, who surveyed out the land and 
um, marked up the land, divided up into little plots uh, so that uh, Tuarangi could grow potatoes, wheat and uh, raise animals here. And that was his envisaged plan. A couple of times Tawairo was actually abandoned and uh, Tuarangi went back to their main pa, uh, Tawaroa. However, tourism became the main uh, money owner. Uh, from about the late 1860s onward, and tourists would come across that Ohinamatu and they'd uh, take the trail up by horse and buggy. Come through Tikitapu. Come through the Otokake. And the first thing they'd see was a big sign telling them how much it was going to cost to get to see the pink and white terraces. If it was a single person, that was two pounds to be rowed across there. And then they had discounts for bigger numbers. So we come here, stay the night, uh, one of two hotels, uh, both owned by two Arangi. Ngāti Hinemi had a hotel called the Rotomahana, and the reason for that was um, the name was because that's where the terraces were. And the Tuarangi under the chief, Tangi Puapi, who lived across the road up, up on the hill, they had leased land to build another hotel called the Terrace Hotel. And the reason they needed the hotel was because back on the lake, Waitangi, uh, Ngāti Uruhina had bought bigger boats to take the tourists. So to, to capture the market, they built hotels here. This is the site where once stood the ancestral meeting house Hinami. Hinami was a meeting house that was built under the instruction of the chief of Ngāti Hinami, Āparo Te Parekānipa. And he got in the, the Tauraua expert canoe builders and meeting house builders Ngāti Te Rāwhai. And they came in and built the house for him. And the house, I suppose, was distinctive in that instead of having power or eyes, Āparo in the display of his outrageous wealth, put sovereigns in the eyes of Queen Victoria. He used it to not only for tangihanga in tribal meetings, but also to run concerts for the visitors. And they'd walk across from the hotels, and for 30 shillings a head, they'd be entertained with stories, kapahaka, uh, and the like each night. <laughs> 